Cool. Uh, thanks, guys, for coming. My name is Kyle, and this talk is going to be about derivatives platforms. And if you have no idea what that is, because I've had a couple of people walk up to me and tell me that, then don't worry. It's, uh, we're going to start at the foundations and just gain a basic intuition for what they are. And once we know what they are and why we use them, we're going to look at them from a security perspective. So a little bit of background on myself. So I'm the co-founder, CEO, and a security researcher at IOSIRO. We're a specialized team focusing on Web3 and crypto security. We've been in the space since around 2017, and that's just a little bit after I got interested in the space in 2016, after a huge hack happened. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I've pretty much been doing stuff in that space. Is the mic working? Yeah, yeah sorry. I'm getting feedback. Okay. Um, yeah, so I've been doing stuff in this space, uh, smart contract auditing and other sort of uh, auditing or security work for crypto companies for the past uh, couple of years. And if you're listening to this stuff and you feel like it's very tangential to your existing knowledge, uh, my background is I'm ex-MWR. I actually headed up the cybersecurity team or the, the research team at MWR for a couple of years. My background is in mobile and in embedded systems specifically. And yeah, I managed to get a point to own while I was there as well. So that was a great experience while I was there. All right, so enough about me. Let's talk about derivative markets. So firstly, derivatives. Uh, derivatives derive their value from some underlying asset. So you can think of crude oil, for example. If you want exposure to the price of crude oil, you're not going to buy barrels of the stuff and store it in your garage, right? It's just not practical. So instead of doing that, what we do is we have a representation of that asset, or some sort of like derivative concept, right, that represents that value. And we've got a couple of different types of markets that are used to trade these things. We've got futures and forwards and options and so forth. Uh, and they pretty much stipulate the terms and conditions of how the contracts work. And when we're talking about the underlying asset, I mean, common examples are just stocks and commodities and currencies and so forth, very common things that you'd want to trade. But for the purposes of this talk, we're going to focus in on a specific type of derivative market. We're going to be talking about perpetual markets, also known as perpetual futures markets. Now, what makes them special compared to other types of derivative markets is that their contracts run indefinitely. They run in perpetuity. So if you're talking about a futures contract, uh, that will generally have a settlement date where you need to close your contract. And so you say, OK, on the 1st of January 2024, that's when the contract ends, and then you need to close your position. But with a, derivat with a perpetual derivative market, you can actually run in perpetuity. You don't have to close your position until you want to close it or you get liquidated. So what's very important to understand during this talk of how they work, and we're going to talk about it a lot, is long positions versus short positions. You've got these two counteracting forces pulling against each other, uh, trying to even each other out. And the long positions, what they're trying to do is they will take a long position in the market. They will say, I expect the price to move upwards. I think that I'm bullish on this thing, so the price goes up, and then I benefit from it. But short positions, they take the other side of that trade. They're going to say that, hey, I'm buying this, uh, this short position, and if the asset price goes down, then I benefit from it. And this is a little bit unintuitive for us, because we're very used to you know, like buying a house, seeing the price of the house inflate, and then uh, we make money from it. But understanding shorts is a little bit less uh, intuitive for us to understand. When an asset price goes down, we're making money from it. And it's interesting, because shorting has uh, a little bit of a bad reputation in some circles, because uh, it can be a little bit controversial, right? You're investing money or you're, you're uh, be, 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 um, bidding against a company's failure. You want that company to fail because then you're going to make money from it. But uh, just to give you an example of why this isn't necessarily the case, let's look at hedging. So let's say that you're a walnut farmer and you have this farm of walnuts and that's all that you do, right? And when the price of walnuts goes up, you do very well. But when the price of walnuts goes down, well, then the only thing you're going to be eating is your walnuts. So what you can do as a farmer is you can take out a short position on the price of walnuts. So that when the price goes up, then your farm does well. 
But when the price of walnuts goes down, then the price of your short goes up. So you've got this counterbalance in place to de-risk yourself from the walnut price. And that concept is called hedging, and it's largely made possible because of the ability to short. But the other really important characteristic to understand here is leverage. And leverage allows you to speculate better. It allows you to better match your risk, uh, exp or your, your desire for risk with the, your, your actual exposure. So for example, let's say you've got 10,000 Rand in the bank account, and your rich aunt who's in the gold industry comes to you and says that, hey, I've got some inside information. This is illegal, but I'm telling you anyways. We've run out of gold. This whole country's run out of gold. We don't have any more. So we can expect the price to go up because there's going to be a massive shortage, right? So you take your 10,000 Rand and you go buy a gold bar and you leave it you know, in your garage for a couple months. And you come back and the price has quadrupled. So now you've got 40,000 Rand of gold, which is great, you know, 30,000 Rand return, fantastic. But let's say that instead of taking your 10,000 Rand and buying the bar, that you go to a perpetual market and you use leverage. Some of these places, they've got like 50x leverage. So let's just say that you take your 10,000 Rand and you get 50x leverage. Now you've got 500,000 Rand of exposure to the asset. So if you wait that same amount of time and you quadruple the asset price again, you're at 2 million Rand. So now from 10,000 Rand, you would have effectively gotten to 2 million Rand minus that 500,000 Rand that you initially borrowed. So you've got 1.5 million Rand from 10,000 Rand. So that's why you want leverage, is that when you re feel really optimistic on an asset, you can actually gain as much exposure to that asset as you want to. So shorting and leverage, they both manage risk profiles. That's the essence of it, and that's made possible through derivative markets. So let's look at what this actually looks like in practice. Let's say that you've got a user with $500, and they go to a perpetual market, and they say, I want to use that $500 to create a position. That means that I want to open up against the Apple shares, you know, the like Apple, like Tim Cook uh, share price, uh, and I want to go in the long direction. So I think that the price is going to move upwards, and I would like 2x leverage. So you take that $500, and the perpetual market says, sure, I'll take your $500 as collateral, and in exchange for that, I'm going to take a I'm going to give you $1,000 of exposure, because it's 2x leverage. So the perpetual market is lending that $1,000 to the user in exchange for $500 of collateral. So that's the process of opening a position. Let's look at what happens once you've opened it and the price actually shifts. So here we've got our Apple long. Our entry price is $200. So that means that the price of the Apple shares is $200 when we open it. Then we've got our $500 of margin, which is the collateral for the position. And then we've got the 2x leverage, which gives us a total size of $1,000. So then we wait some time, and it goes up by 10%. The price goes up to $220. Then we calculate the final amount out as your $1,000 of exposure multiplied by the 10% gain, which is $100. And you're obviously going to get your $500 of collateral back. So you, the net amount out is $600. It's a 20% gain on your initial amount, which is just the 10% multiplied by two from the leverage. Okay, so then a natural question to ask yourself is, well, where does the $100 come from? Where does my profit come from? And the answer to this is in the market skew. So when I said that there's these counteracting forces of shorts and longs, you have these two opposing sides that are trading against each other. Now, in this example, we can see that there's $100 million of positions on the short side and $100 million of shorts on the long side. And what we would call this is we would say that this has a neutral skew, which means that the total size of the market is $200 million because there's 100, 100, but the skew is zero because they're counterbalancing each other. You subtract them from each other. And this is considered a very safe type of market because what happens is if you've got a 10% price shift in either direction, let's say that the price goes up by 10%, then your long side is going to be worth $110 million and your short side is going to be worth $90 million. So you would have just shifted the 10 million from the one side to the other side. Now, how do you get the skew? Well, again, when you open up short positions, you're increasing the exposure on the, the short side, so you're skewing the market short, and when you're opening long positions, you're increasing the long side. But also, 
closing positions has an effect, right? Like when you close a long position, you're also reducing the counterbalance. So you're also skewing it further to the short side and vice versa for when you're closing uh, the short side. So the next natural question to ask yourself is, where does the leverage come from? And here I've got an example of a system. You've got the traders, they've got their margin, and they're paying some fees to the market. Now, if it was just as simple as this, you wouldn't actually have any leverage. You would only be able to say, hey, I've got $500, and I'm bringing it to the market. Can I trade with my $500? But there's actually a second actor in the system, and they're called the liquidity providers. So liquidity is just a fancy term for money, right? You've got some excess money available to you. So you take it to the market and you say, here, here's my money. I'm going to loan it to you. And then traders can borrow that money and they're going to pay fees when they're borrowing. And then those fees go to the market and then the fees get paid to the liquidity providers. So if you've got some excess money lying around, you can actually go do this and make money from it. But then you might tell me, well, Sounds kind of risky, right? Because traders don't always make the right calls. They might lose money. What happens in the worst case? So this is when liquidations happen, right? So let's say that we've got exactly the same setup as before. The entry price is $200. This time we're taking a short, though. So we want the price to go down. And we've got $500 of margin, the collateral. But this time we're feeling adventurous, right? We feel like we really have some information here, so we want to take 10x leverage. So our total size is $5,000. We sit around for some time and, oh no, we went in the wrong direction and now we've just gained 10%, right? Which is what, not what we wanted. And if you do some basic math here, you can see 10% times 10x leverage, 100%. So you can see here that you gave $500 of collateral, but your position also lost $500. So at that point, the total value of that position is zero dollars. And if it was to go any further down and go into the negative, then all of a sudden, the other participants in the system, the other traders, are supporting that trader's position and you've got an uh, insolvent system. So what needs to happen is that somebody needs to come along and liquidate that position as soon as it gets to zero or even slightly before it be uh, becomes zero. And what happens when you liquidate is you take that, uh, that margin, the collateral that was provided by the trader, you take it away from them. And what you do with it depends on the implementation, but let's say that you can just take it to the perpetual market and now it's extra collateral. Uh, that's the first step. And then the second step is that $5,000 of size needs to be removed from the market. So you're reducing the skew on, um, on the long side because you've just cl closed the short, right? Sorry, you're reducing the, the, skew, the short side because you closed the short. Okay, so that's the gist of perpetual markets. Now you understand all the terminology, kind of on the same page. Now we can talk about how we're going to attack them, right? In order to do this, we're going to talk about a client of ours called Synthetics. Now, they are called a liquidity protocol, and I will show you what that means in two seconds. But yeah, they generate about $85 million of volume per day. So that means about $85 million of trades are happening each and every day. And they're generating in excess of $100,000 of fees per day, which are paid out to the liquidity providers. And also, if you're wondering, like, why can I talk about this stuff in the public? It's because there's a general ethos and philosophy of openness in this space. So all of their code is open source. You can go find it on GitHub yourself, as well as our audit reports, which you can also go read through if you're interested. Right, so compared to the previous example, uh, this looks kind of similar. We've got liquidity providers on the left-hand side. Those are just any users. They could be you. If you've got some crypto lying around, you could go be a liquidity provider yourself. You take it to Synthetics and you say, here, here's some collateral um, or, or some, mar um, some funds that you can make use of. And then Synthetics will distribute that liquidity to different markets. And the type of market, I mean, there's many different types, a spot market where you can go trade from asset to asset, or a perp market, what we're talking about now, or an insurance market, right? It really doesn't matter, as long as it's generating fees. So what happens is these markets generate the fees, they go back to synthetics, and then they send the fees back to liquidity providers. And this is termed a liquidity protocol. So they are the middleware sitting between the markets and the, the liquidity. 
So what we're going to do now is we're going to zoom in on their perpetual market implementation, because Synthetix actually has their own perps market. Now, it's interesting because we literally finished the audit of this implementation like yesterday, pretty much. And you can see the scope of the audit that we conducted here. It's about 30 files of Solidity. And Solidity code is just the execution code of the actual perpetual market. And it's only about 4,300 lines of code, which is really not that much if you think about it. However, the full engagement still took over a month over several people. And that sounds pretty absurd if you don't know what we're doing, right? And the people are actually sitting in the audience today, by the way. Uh, so yeah, you need to look at what we're actually doing. And to get an understanding of that, let's look at this diagram. So typically, like let's say if you're doing a pen test of this thing, right? If you're just doing a pen test, you might think to fuzz it, put some weird values in, uh, check the access control, especially from a black box perspective, it's going to be very difficult to figure out like how do you approach this thing, right? So our methodology is that the very first and most important step is to read the documentation. Now, this is important because apart from all the logic that gets applied, we need to look at the business logic of how this thing is intended to function. We need to look at what, is, what are you doing? Your opening positions, closing positions, modifying positions, of course, all of this stuff. But we also want to look at the game mechanics of the, of the system. We want to look at what incentives are in place to encourage or discourage certain behaviors in the system. And so when we're reading the specification, we are actually thinking to ourselves, okay, well, yeah, you're doing this, but what about this? And we're effectively threat modeling while we read through the, um, the business logic. And once we've got that level of understanding, then we go do a very intense code review. So this is you know, doing it generally in pairs where you have to go like really understand every single little operation that's happening in the code. And then we'll do unit testing to make sure that it works as it should. And then after that, we'll do some general like mathematical modeling or some sort of uh, rep alternative representation of the code to make sure that it actually does what we think it does and that there's no like outliers or some sort of like weird edge cases. And then, of course, there's other tooling that you can make use of as well. Yeah, it's not that great, though. So here's a function called diagram. It is spaghetti, you'll see. Uh, very difficult to understand it at this level. So we're not going to approach the system at this level. Don't worry. Instead of that, we're going to focus in on a very specific topic and try to understand that well. And then once we have that understanding, we're going to move on to how do you break that topic. It's called full price. And as I said, the first step here is to read the documentation. So we get given something like this. It will say it's a premium discount function, a configurable variable, blah, 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 blah. What's important is at the end, we have a, a function, right? We've got execution price is equal to article price multiplied by 1 plus 0 0.5 multiplied by premium before plus premium after. Okay, So I'm assuming you all understand what you're trying to achieve here, right? Obviously not, so let me just give you an example to get an intuition for what we're trying to do. So let's say that we have a short skewed market. So we can see that the short side is larger than the long side. Now let's just hypothetically say that instead of using a price of $200, we artificially lower it to $195. Now what is the actual effect of this? Well, when you're opening a short position, what you want is to have as high of a starting price as possible and as low of an ending price as possible. So you want that price differential to be as big as possible so you can make as much money as you can. So when we come and we open a short position, if the price is lower than it should be, that means we're making less money out of it because our start price is lower. So we can't actually get as much of a difference from it. So if we go from $100, instantaneously, as soon as you open that position at a lower price, now your position is worth $97.4. So from this, we can understand that there's a disincentive in place from when the market is skewed short to open more short positions, because that's just going to make it more and more dangerous, because you need to keep these things in parity, right? But conversely, when you look at the long side, again, you want a low starting price there. So now we've created an incentive to increase or for long positions to start opening, right? And so now we can get an understanding of this works on both the short and the long side when you're opening positions. But what's interesting is that this also works when you close positions. Because when you want to close your short, 
you want as low of a price as possible, right? So you've gone from $100 to $102.6. So you've created an incentive for closing short positions because this will also reduce the short skew. And conversely, if you've got a long position and somebody's closing that, we really don't want that to happen because now we're losing that support that we have on the long side. So we've also disincentivized users from closing their positions in that circumstance. So here I've got a little code snippet. So this is actual Solidity, the stuff that we read through. And I'm not going to go through it in too much detail, but we're effectively calculating the price, uh, pri premium discount before, premium discount after, price before, price after. And then we've got this return function of price before plus price after uh, divided by 1 divided by 2, so divided by 0 0.5. Now, if any of you caught that there is a mistake in this, and it should actually be multiplied by 0 0.5, you might have a budding career in this industry. Because this is exactly the type of stuff that we're looking for. It's these very fine details that, I mean, just the, like a wrong uh, operator could lead to catastrophe in certain instances. Just again, one other level of understanding of how this works. So this graph represents a market where the initial skew is zero. So it's just balanced out. It's like $100 million, $100 million, for example. And the price is $200. Now, if we look at the middle of the size zero, uh, we'll see that that has a final price of $200. So we're effectively creating a position of size zero there. So we're not doing anything. So it keeps it at zero. There's no price difference. However, when we move to the left-hand side and we see the negative values, this means that we're opening a short position. So when we create a slightly small short, so just minus 250, the prices decrease a little bit. As that short gets larger and larger, then the price drops further and further. And conversely, on the other side, uh, when you're opening positions with positive numbers, uh, as you open a larger and larger long position, you're going to have a larger and li larger price impact. And so it's just this linear graph. And now we feel comfortable, you know, we have thought of this idea, we've read the specification, we've confirmed the code works as it should, um, we've even graphed it out, you know, and now we feel like, okay, cool, this, is, this works, right? And this is where you'd be wrong, because we need to take it a little bit further. As I said, we need to consider the actual business logic and like how does the rest of the system work uh, when we implement a system like this? And that first attack is called liquidation counter trading. Sounds a little bit scary, but it's quite simple. Let's say that you have a market with a skew of $100,000 on the short side. So as we said, when you've got a short skew, you drop the price. So we go from $200 to $195. Then we look at the state of the system, and we can see that there is a large liquidation coming up. It's $100,000, in fact. So we know that if that position gets liquidated, it's going to get removed from the market, and it's going to jump the price back of Apple from $195 to $200 as soon as that liquidation happens, remember, because it's going to close the short, and then it's going to shift over the price instantly. So what we can do in this instance is we can counter trade it. We can say, OK, the price is going to be low. It's going to be $195. And as soon as the liquidation happens, it's going to jump up to $200. So we're going to buy along $195, sell along $200, within a second. And we're going to instantly see a 2.6% increase. Now, that sounds cool, but I mean, 2.6% isn't actually that much. Uh, but don't forget that we have leverage available to us, right? So I've got a unit test here that uh, we put together. Uh, you can see that you open positions with a neutral skew. So you've got a size of $200,000. So there's $100,000 on the one side, $100,000 on the other side. Therefore, your skew is zero. An attacker's starting balance is $10,000. Then you wait some time. The price increases until a stage that the short can get liquidated. So we open up a 10K long position at 5X leverage. So now we've got $50,000 of exposure. Then we perform the liquidation. And we close our position. And now we've got $12,500, which is a 25% gain. It's a little bit more impressive. So how do we stop this? Well, it's actually quite tricky to prevent this, to be honest. Uh, but the solution that Synthetix has used is that they fragment their liquidations. So say now you've got some really large position that needs to get liquidated. You're not going to do it all in one go. 
Instead, you're going to do one initial liquidation just to make sure that the position stops moving and that the trader cannot do anything with it anymore. And then after that, you're going to break it up into several other smaller liquidations. So you'll, and also, like the point of this is that uh, the, the net amount is still the same, but because it happens over time, the markets are very competitive. So there's arbitrages who are constantly trading up and down, and it just makes it a lot less predictable from an attacker's perspective to do it over several uh, different amounts. Then moving on to the second attack, which is called cascading liquidations. So if you reflect back on when I explained liquidations to you, I said that there's that $500 that needs to go somewhere, right? Now, in this world, and with, synth with the synthetics implementation, where that $500 actually goes to is the person who performs the liquidation. Well, a large portion of it goes to the person who performs the liquidation. So anybody, you can go out and you can monitor the state of synthetics. You can look for positions that need to be liquidated, and then you can tell them that that position needs to be liquidated. And then they will pay you for that. They'll pay you a lot of money for that. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's liquidation. So what could we do to possibly exploit this scenario? So let's look at the this market conditions here. You know, we've got $500 skew long, and we've got a price of $200. So what we do is we say, okay, let's go get a list of all the accounts that are relatively close to being liquidated. So the liquidation price is pretty close to the $200 mark. But then we remember, if we're using the full price concept, that you can actually manipulate the price as an external user, right? You can go open a position and then affect the price to move upwards or downwards. So let's imagine that as an attacker, you open a short position of size 200, because remember, minus 200 is a short. What happens then is that you reduce the skew uh, from 500 to 300, and then you reduce the price from 200 to 199.8. And when you look at that, all of a sudden, the first account becomes liquidatable. So you go ahead and you liquidate that account and you get money for it. But what's interesting here is that you would notice that this is a long position that we're liquidating. So we're actually increasing the skew on the short side. And so we go from 300 to minus 300. And our price drops a further 0.6% or 0.6 cents. So we then land up at 199.2, which means another account can be liquidated. So we go ahead, we liquidate it, we make tons of cash, and would you look at it? We can liquidate the third account as well, and we can go and make more cash. So the point here is that you've got this cascading effect. As you liquidate one account, more accounts become liquidatable. And this is called cascading liquidations, and it comes in a lot of different flavors, actually. And it's very, very dangerous. If this happens to a market, you can have complete collapse of a market. Uh, I'm not just talking about perps markets, I'm talking about in general that everything can just get lost all in like a single second, right? So in order to fix this, uh, what we need to do is we can't use the full price, right? We can't let external parties affect that the price of liquidations. So we just use the base price. We just use that $200 with no influence uh, from, the, um, from the external parties. And if this sounds a little bit uh, too much like fantasy and like too theoretical, well, it's very funny because about two weeks ago, DYDX, which is a competitor to synthetics, they were hacked through a price manipulation attack for $9 million. And yeah, so there's a real world example. It's quite different to anything I've explained here, but uh, the attack actually happened over several days. It was highly coordinated, but the, the hacker made off with over $9 million. Then the second piece of evidence I have for you that this is quite serious is the fact that Synthetics has a $100,000 bug bounty available. So as I mentioned, uh, all this code is publicly available. You can go read through it yourself, go learn about this stuff, and then you can go find bugs in it and um, get $100,000. And what's interesting is that this is actually relatively low for this industry, right? You've got some bug bounties that have millions of dollars in bug bounties. And uh, like there's one famous one that was $10 million that has now been reduced a little bit. But uh, yeah, this, they take it very seriously. And the reason for this is that there's a lot of money at stake. Remember what I said earlier, there's $85 million of volume per day on this uh, perpetual market. So imagine if you could get even a slice of that. So that brings us to the conclusion 
of the talk. Uh, we started off by looking at the the why and the how of derivative markets, and hopefully you gain an understanding for like, because I know we're all security people here, but you know, and we like to scoff at financial tools sometimes, but uh, they are actually uh, very useful for economies. And then also, I hope that uh, if you've got a background in cybersecurity, that you might see that this stuff seems very foreign, but actually your skill set does translate very well to this type of stuff, right? Even if it seems foreign. And then also, I hope that you gained an understanding of how intensive these things are, because you know, if you're dealing with millions of dollars, that uh, it's an adversarial environment where you've got everybody trying to steal money from you constantly. It's out in the public. It's very scary and you need to take the job very seriously um, because a single mistake can lead to uh, millions of dollars being lost. Yeah, thank you. Cool. Any questions? Yeah? Right, so the question was, uh, what tools does a market or a system have to protect against cascading liquidations? And the answer is that it depends on the type of cascading liquidation. If it's an atomic one, so that means that the cascade happens in a single transaction, there's nothing you can do about it, actually. Uh, you're, you can get completely destroyed in a single like, transaction. Uh, but if you've got something that takes a little bit of time, uh, then you generally look at monitoring solutions where you can either front-run transactions, so if you can um, in certain systems, you can actually look at the state on chain and you can say, okay, what transactions are about to happen? And you can say, okay, I'm going to emulate this transaction and see uh, what's the effect of it. And if I can see it's bad, I'm going to stop it. Uh, or I'm going to do the same transaction before they can do it. Um, but uh, in other systems, you might just monitor like over time, like, hey, like I can see some malicious behaviors happening. So we're just going to stop the system, deploy an upgrade, fix it, yeah. like that because the whole purpose of a market is for people to find edge cases that they, they can exploit yeah so, so it's a very interesting question so asking like I mean you could even argue with uh, the counter trading example like well is it actually a hack you know you're just doing market stuff right the markets doing market things but I would argue that uh, it depends on whether you're exploiting edge cases in the system, right? Is that intentional behavior? And I would say that a cascading liquidation isn't intentional because as a market, uh, you don't, I mean, that's, it's, it's not intended to happen. And, uh, under certain circumstances, you could probably argue that it's intentional, but generally speaking, I mean, it's just that the system was uh, incorrectly uh, configured, yeah. Any other questions, yeah? Uh, yeah, thank you so much, that was a really good talk. Um, I was wondering if, in your experience, and maybe by working with, I uh, forgot their name now, Synthetics, yeah. um, it, because there have been quite a few high-profile flash loan attacks where you take out money from a liquidity protocol in order to then buy stakes and other Web3 projects to change their governance models. Um, and then once they've changed the governance models, they, they're able to, and in one case, I, I, I remember they were able to basically change the uh, emergency response procedures and then pay out mm. um, you know, all the funds to their own private wallets and then pay back the liquidity protocol. So obviously the liquidity protocol didn't do anything wrong here, but are there any, I don't know, controls in place that somebody like Synthetics could put in place to prevent uh, the abuse of these flash loans? Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering what your experience is. Yeah, well, Thank you for the question. Um, so I would say it's, it's a very interesting question, again, because it's, it comes down to philosophy, in my opinion, right? You want, in the crypto space, you want things to be open, right? That's the whole reason that we have crypto is that it's permissionless. Anybody can go out and do things on it, right? Like you're not stopped by the South African Reserve Bank or SARS or whatever, right? You can go and do whatever you want to, pretty much, uh, depending on your local laws, right? Um, and so we don't really want to prohibit certain actions from happening, right? Like, how can we say that, yes, you can use a flash loan for this, but you can't use it for that, right? That's how I would see it, at least. It's more the responsibility of the protocols that are being targeted to say, okay, well, flash loans exist. How can I stop them from attacking me, right? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, 
the Kyber hack. Do you mind if we chat afterwards? Because I just don't want to, it's a little bit, yeah. Okay. 100%. And then, uh, are you running any liquidation bots or anything like that? Your researchers and team? I can neither confirm nor deny that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, cool. Thanks, guys.